Each of today's episodes features a classic Twilight Zone twist. Let's get to it, shall we? Hold it. Hold it. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. We start our first episode with some stock footage of a rocket launch, before we flash forward to Mission Control sometime later, where some boffins mildly commiserate over the fact that, whoopsie, they lost track of the rocket, even with all those handy flags on the table and blinky lights behind them. One of the guys is so baffled, his glasses disappear and reappear on his face. The other guy quotes Longfellow. He shot an arrow into the air. It landed I know not where. Omitting the part of the poem that totally gives away the episode's twist. Meanwhile, we meet the four survivors of the rocket, who crashed on what the commander, Colonel Donlin, thinks is an asteroid. I know, a couple of episodes ago, I made fun of a supposed asteroid that looked like Death Valley or White Sands, where it was obviously filmed, but to prove I can be generous and suspend my disbelief, let's just go with it this time. Half the crew is dead, and one of the survivors, Navigator Hudak, is mortally injured. One of the others, Cory, proves to be one of the warmest and kindest human beings to ever live, as he abuses the colonel and argues against wasting any water on the injured man. The colonel insists they will not abandon anyone, and when Cory starts bordering on insubordination, the colonel has the last word, by quoting Ivan Drago. If he dies, he dies. Pearson notes that the sun is weirdly the same size as it is on Earth, and the colonel is all like, yeah, isn't it wild how lucky we are to be able to breathe this air and survive okay in this temperature? There's hinting at a twist, and then there's just telling the audience what's happening. Sometime later, the colonel and Corey bicker once more about giving water to an injured man, but instead of suffering over the argument again, Hudak decides to put an end to it by just dying. Corey, as a result, immediately steals the dead man's canteen, because he's just such a great person. Pearson yells at him, but the colonel ends the fight before it can really begin, wisely knowing that, with only the three of them left, they'll need to stick together to survive. With that in mind, he immediately sends Pearson and Corey away to scout the area while he stays behind to light his triangle on fire. That night, Corey returns and says he and Pearson got separated. Then, as Corey pours more water down his shirt than in his mouth, the colonel begins suspecting what we're all suspecting. That aliens must have given him water, obviously. With the colonel confronting him about how he had so much water, the paragon of virtue that is crewman Corey admits to lying, but he pinky swears that Pearson just fell and hit his head on a rock, dying instantly, which is when Corey had no choice but to take his water and come back. The colonel tells Corey they're going back to the body, and after Corey whines like a little biatch, the colonel picks him up, takes the man's sidearm, and then leads him back out into the barren wasteland, a rifle at the ready. After day breaks, Corey takes a short break to prove he still can't drink properly, and that he's thinking of murder. But the colonel isn't a complete idiot. When they finally reach the place where Corey claims Pearson died, all they find is a trail where Pearson must have crawled away. Corey justifies taking his water and leaving him for dead by insisting he was really, really thirsty. I was so thirsty. My tongue was swelling up. I swear my tongue was swelling up. Man, Corey is just the best, isn't he? After they find him, unable to speak, Pearson draws what looks like a cross in the dirt before finally expiring. The colonel, demonstrating that maybe he actually is a complete idiot, then leaves his rifle next to Corey and goes to look over the hill. Predictably, Corey picks up the weapon and kills his commanding officer. Look, I get it, he just wants to survive, but if they're on an asteroid, does it really make that much of a difference? What they really needed was a destination that they couldn't reach together with the rations that they had, but maybe one person could reach if they used all the rations. That would give more weight to the moral choices this episode wants us to ponder. Anyway, with just one man still alive and the episode still needing a couple of minutes before the big reveal, 
Rod Serling hops in to pass the time by mercilessly mocking Corey as he continues his trek through the vast nothingness. Make tracks, Mr. Corey. Push up and push out, because if you stop, if you stop, maybe sanity will get you by the throat. Eventually, the scene has been padded long enough, and we finally learn what Pearson was drawing in the sand. Power lines. Yeah, they really were in White Sands. Oh my god, I was wrong. It was Earth all along. I really love what this episode is trying to do, and it demonstrates that the Twilight Zone was completely comfortable with its style by this point in the series' run. However, I do feel like the script needed another pass or two. It doesn't bother me that the twist is easy to see coming, but I do feel like the punch doesn't quite land as well as it could. Maybe if Corey had been more sympathetic, or like I said before, if the plot were reworked to make his argument more coldly rational, or if maybe civilization had been just over the hill instead of a few days' walk in the far distance, it could have all gelled a little better. Kind of like that brutal ending to The Mist. Don't get me wrong, this is a really good episode that does a lot with surprisingly little. I only find it frustrating because I like it as much as I do, because I want it to be just that little bit better. Hurt finger! Band-Aid plastic bandage and collar! Ah! Next, we meet Nan Adams, a woman on a cross-country trip who has just had a blowout on the road that, according to the mechanic who comes to help her, should have resulted in a deadly accident. After getting a temporary tire, you know, a donut, but not the delicious kind, she starts to follow the mechanic to his shop to get a real one. She sees a hitchhiker by the side of the road, but she does the smart thing and doesn't pick him up. Then, at the shop, as she shells out 30 bucks for everything, boy was it a different time, she sees the hitchhiker again, but he vanishes. She leaves, and the hitchhiker decides to jump scare us for some reason. As she drives, she continues to see the same guy over and over again, and it starts to freak her out so much, she starts narrating. Wherever I stop, I see him. No matter how far I travel or how fast I go, he's ahead of me. As I understand it, this episode is based on a radio play, and it shows. It's tough to have a story from a single person's point of view, but the nature of this story demands that the protagonist be alone. It's kind of a catch-22. She comes to a roadblock, but when the hitchhiker approaches her stopped car... Heading west? I'm not heading west, I'm just going up the road a little way! She blows through the barrier and speeds away, fully unhinged. Then she comes to a railroad crossing, and again seeing the hitchhiker beckoning her forward, she gets stuck on the train tracks. We get a long, suspenseful sequence of her trying to move her car as the train approaches, which is only slightly ruined when the passing train briefly turns into a kazoo. Losing her mind, Nan drives and drives through three days and nights, stopping only for food. I guess she never has to pee. She apparently did forget to stop for gas, however, as her car breaks down at a side road, serendipitously only a few feet from a service station. Alas, the place is run by an unsympathetic jerk who refuses to help her, no matter how much she cries or how crazy she acts. All of her sobbing gets the attention of a nearby sailor, though, who just so happens to be trying to get to his ship in San Diego, which is in the same direction Nana's going. When she begs him to come along with her to keep her company, he uses the power of patriarchy to get the station attendant to actually help them. Fast forward to the road, where the two make awkward conversation, while sitting absurdly close and half-facing each other in the front seat. I'm no expert on the 1950s, as you all probably know by now, but uh, did people really sit like that in their car? Nan hides her crazy for a while, but she eventually sees the hitchhiker, which the sailor doesn't see. When Nan sees him again, she swerves, not to avoid the man, but to outright kill him. The sailor makes her stop the car, offers to take the wheel, and then when she tries to explain herself, he finally realizes he got in the wrong vehicle. She tries her best to get him to stay, 
even offering to take him out for a good time. But she must not know the truth about those Navy boys. <laughs> Calm down, it's just a joke. The sailor is impossibly polite, advises her to get some sleep, and then leaves her behind. Nan finds a place to stop and uses the payphone to call her mother. A stranger answers the phone and explains that Nan's mother has had a nervous breakdown following the unfortunate death of her daughter, who was killed in a car accident after having a blowout on the road. She's dead, Jim. Realizing that she is not alive anymore, a calm numbness overcomes Nan. She makes peace with it all and decides to pick up the hitchhiker the next time she sees him. Sure enough, he finds her almost immediately, and they drive off together into the night. If you've been watching me long enough, you know I'm a sucker for these kinds of stories. I totally love this episode, but it's carried by more than just a compelling, creepy story. The actress who plays Nan, Inger Stevens, is incredibly good in what couldn't be an easy role to play, and even though very little happens, the pacing of the episode keeps you engaged throughout. Stuff like this is what The Twilight Zone does best. And that's all I have on I Shot an Arrow into the Air and The Hitchhiker. Now, as always, do all those youtube -y things. Check out my Patreon. Eh? Eh? Please? And all that other good stuff. But until next time, this is The Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love. As long as you're not hurting anybody. The whole thing comes to $29.70. It's cheaper than a funeral, isn't it?